for Musk to go so aggressively in favor of one candidate, completely alienating the other candidate, is a huge deal, especially considering the vast amount of government contracts that his sort of sprawling business empire holds. So this is a totally unique state of affairs. He's not just endorsing, he's campaigning. He's very confident that Trump's going to win, and he's using his social platform to really push that narrative. Hi, I'm Derek Robertson. I am a reporter for Politico and one of the authors of the Digital Future Daily Newsletter. Hi, I'm Amanda Hoover. I'm a senior correspondent for Business Insider. Hi, I'm Christine Moy. I'm a tech policy reporter for Politico, and I also help write Digital Future Daily. It's now becoming more difficult than ever to separate Musk, the political figure, from Musk, the businessman. Derek, let's start with you. Um, you know, why is Musk's endorsement of Trump so significant and specifically his growing affinity toward MAGA politics? It is because he sits at the intersection of a couple of different trends in American life, one being the increasing importance of tech firms to governance and to public life. The other is the simple fact that he's the world's richest man. You tend to have a lot of weight to throw around when you have more money than everybody else. Third is that unlike other businessmen, he does not feel the need to hedge or equivocate in his political support whatsoever. Yeah, you wrote about Henry Ford and, you know, you just said that in comparison to right, even those historical examples, like his wealth and his influence is just so immense. Like there's not really, it doesn't match up in terms of scale. Yeah, that's right. You have to go back to the kind of gilded age but truly his wealth is you know it is like a carnegie like a rockefeller and the the scope of his business empire is similar to that so it beggars modern comparison even when you think of people as wealthy as jeff bezos or mark zuckerberg even before right he aligned himself firmly in trump's camp like he trump, musk has always exerted influence through twitter now x um what are the ways in which he's done that and how have you seen that change since he's bought twitter so much has changed about the platform. He really scaled back a lot of moderation, like let other accounts, including Donald Trump, come back onto the platform. We're seeing him posting increasingly his political views and the, those views have shifted and changed. There is also, you know, some new data from The Washington Post showing that Republicans are getting followed way more on X than Democrats. But it kind of shows like the feelings that some people get, I think, when they're on there, that it seems like there's a lot of elevation of pro-MAGA views. There's obviously like lots of mis and disinformation that Musk himself posts. He really just is like the, this huge presence on X that people see, even if they don't follow him, you know, he ends up in the feed. So it's really become a very powerful way for him to put himself in front of so many people. And like looking through his feed, like how much do you see parallels? I mean, you know, is he just repeating what Trump is saying or are there areas where he, you know, you see kind of key differences or he's diverging from, you know, Trump's views? There are places where they meaningful they meaningfully differ. Trump is vehemently anti-EV. Musk is arguably the most almost inarguably the most important EV manufacturer ever. I won't do my Trump impersonation. I will spare everybody that. But he was like, uh, you know, Elon has softened me a little bit toward electric vehicles. He, I like him and he's good to me. So maybe we'll be a little easier on electric vehicles. So there are these weird uh, asymmetries between their policy platforms. So do you find like Musk's rise in American politics most recently uh, surprising at all? That's a good question. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this as well, Amanda, because as somebody who's mm -hmm. focused on the platform, because when I think about Musk's rise as a political figure, I think about the centrality of social media platforms to American life. Elon becoming this political does not surprise me because he is a creature of the open, chaotic internet that I grew up on with you know, forums that did not include algorithms and had no moderation whatsoever. That, that environment tends to highlight extreme views. It's such a unique situation almost that he's in because you really, yeah. you know, if you see Mark Zuckerberg post on Facebook, it's very like buttoned up and it's a PR, like yeah, move. it's official. Yes, it's official. Um, even, even when he's wearing his uh, Zuck, uh, oh, the Zuck heel thing. hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just, you don't really see many social media platforms acting the way that a user does, you know, and because Musk was a user of Twitter when it or was that and user. he loved it, yeah. his whole like acquisition of it and his intent with it is just so different than how other owners of these platforms operate. And obviously of these big platforms, 
their owners still have tremendous sway. He's the person that we like see interacting though. And we get to see like his thoughts and his intentions. He's, you know, spelling those out more. This is going to, this is, might sound like it's a bit of a tangent, but I promise it's not. I was on a podcast yesterday where somebody asked me to talk about the matrix and the popularity of like the red pill meme in right wing mm-hmm. circles, which is exactly what we're talking about here when we talk about like audience capture and, and the filter bubble. But this interviewer asked me, you know, do you think the matrix is responsible for introducing this rhetoric into the world and sort of like driving people into their respective echo chambers? And I said, no, because the conditions for this happening already existed some film or some like meme or some cultural device would have come along and unleashed Mm -hmm. that idea regardless of whether the wachowskis like sat down and made a movie where people wear long leather trench coats and like fight each other in uh in the sky what do you make of the fact that he uses and operates the platform as if he doesn't care if it makes money because yeah I, i think you know there's a the surface level read my initial impulse is like well he's the richest man in the world he has all these other businesses who cares if it makes money but also his ownership of twitter is based on an incredibly complicated like high leverage debt program yeah with, like the he saudis 44 <laughs> yeah. million dollars for this this right. platform that has always struggled financially right that's just the long history of it and then immediately as he changed moderation rules like the advertisers fled. It's not really considered a safe place to advertise. He really does operate it like he does not care if it makes money. And I think that that is risky. I think a lot of people are surprised it's still alive because of the way that he's operating it, even with the amount of people he's laid off. People thought that it wouldn't even be able to function. Yeah, he's a sincere ideologue. Like, I don't believe he cares whether it makes money because he has a messianic belief that, like, free speech and defeating the woke mind virus are necessary to ensure the survival of humanity. It sounds like risible probably to like many of the people who will be listening to this podcast, but it's a completely Mm -hmm. sincere and deeply held belief. Well, it might, you know, all pay off for him. Trump has said that if he wins, you know, he'll appoint Elon Musk to a newly created role. Um, He'll lead the Department of Government Efficiency, um, appropriately nicknamed Doge. How many details do we have about exactly what that type of role entails and like in what ways he could use that role to, you know, curry favor and influence for his businesses. Very few details. He's talked a lot about what he wants to do. Elon Musk is very obsessed with reducing waste in government. He has kind of an old school libertarian bent. He wants to, you know, strip away regulations. He has frequently compared the government to uh, bloatware, which is a very nerdy term from the world of computer programming, where you have a piece of iterative software, think about Microsoft Word, and you just redevelop Microsoft Word every year, there's a new Microsoft Word, and the, the code in it becomes so archived that the 25th iteration of it is not as nimble and responsive as the second or third iteration. This is the way he thinks about government. Uh, I'm not, that's not my analysis. He's literally said that. So I think he wants to strip down government, remove regulations, do pretty normal Republican stuff, frankly. How much do we know about his like tussles of regulatory agencies? You mentioned some of them. Um, and which ones would kind of be immediate targets maybe as he, you know, if Trump hands him kind of the scissors to do that? That's a good question. He tends to talk about this kind of thing in generalities and not the uh, policy specifics that the three of us might tend to traffic in as reporters for our respective publications. But, you know, environment is a major concern for him. He loves to tell a story about how a California regulator forced him to take a seal out of a harbor and... uh, make it listen to sonic booms on headphones in order to see what the effect of rocket launching would be on the seal habitation. Mm -hmm. Um, He thinks that was a bad idea. I will refrain from editorializing about whether or not it was because I don't know enough about this. So I think you would have an all out war between Musk and his environmental lower level regulators. And I don't think we should lose sight of the fact in talking about all of this, that when you head up a department that is devoted to managing regulations around a company that you financially directly benefit from, that raises a slew of ethics questions that our fellow reporters at Politico have covered fairly extensively. So he's he's wading into even an even more interconnected thicket of policy risks than I think he faces right now. But, you know, Musk's actions aren't just limited to U.S. politics. Like there was a bombshell report by, you know, the Wall Street Journal that he and you know, Russian President Vladimir Putin had apparently been having regular contact for two two years, you know, including 
this past year when he's like we've been talking about gone all in on trying to get Trump reelected. This is another thing that is unprecedented in recent history. I don't I don't want to use the U word here necessarily. Um, it's unique. I'll use another U word. The issue is not speaking to Vladimir Putin. The issue is that uh, we what are supposed to have about. one foreign policy as a country. <laughs> this is the sort of unique element of Musk's calls with Putin. Essentially, somebody with direct control over battlefield conditions between a geopolitical friend and a geopolitical foe of the United States doing unilateral diplomacy with the foe in that setting is something that has raised a lot of alarm bells in Washington. Yeah, almost immediately there were calls from right the head of NASA, um, the top Democrat on the Armed Services Committee, basically saying we should investigate. They stopped short of saying, you know, we should pull away his security clearance or anything right. like that. Um, but, you know, you looked into in your conversations, you looked into this question of what kind of repercussions are even possible here. NASA itself has become increasingly dependent on Musk for, you know, on SpaceX, right, for access to the International Space Station and also, you know, for launches. When NASA decided that they were going to start regularly contracting with private companies to ferry people to and from space, mm -hmm. they decided that they needed to have more than one contractor, because in the case that one of the contractors contractors failed, it would be important to have a backup. They did this, and Boeing has essentially failed to produce reliable transportation to and from space. So SpaceX, the other contractor, is the only one uh, who is that is reliably shuttling around astronauts for NASA. Now you have this major point of leverage uh, that Musk has over the United States government, which is that you need me to get you to the moon in the coming years, which is, a, you know, a plan of NASA's 3D Artemis project. And I don't know if there's an easy remedy for that, aside from just scrapping the Artemis project or delaying it massively in order to incorporate another contractor or fix the woes that uh, Boeing has done. One detail that was really concerning um, to right, former officials was the fact that um, he was they had a conversation where he was asked about not activating Starlink over Taiwan as a favor to, you know, Chinese President Xi Jinping, just as an example of the kind of right co conflicts of interest that have happened or right. that could come out of this. Yeah. Starlink is currently not active in Taiwan. Musk has repeatedly he's very dovish on Taiwan, meaning that, you know, he's. I think he literally once said, like, it is inevitable that Taiwan will be reunited with China. So this is all insinuation, but uh, it's not easy to see why people in Washington who are more uh, vested on the Taiwan side of this equation are, are very concerned about that. Is Musk an anomaly or is he representative of a bigger role that tech bros and billionaires like him have to play in our electoral politics going forward? I would lean toward representative of a new influence. Take, for example, somebody like Sam Altman, who nobody knew his name roughly two years ago, mm -hmm. and now he's on Capitol Hill constantly, strongly influencing uh, AI policy decision making, strongly influencing like energy policy in many ways because of the extreme thirst for electricity that his products generate. So. You have a federal government that all of us know all too well is, you know, stymied by congressional gridlock, partisan back and forth, you know, bureaucratic uh, sclerosis, et cetera, combined with a dynamic and extremely wealthy tech sector. It's just a Occam's razor. Simplest possible answer to this is yes, tech will have more influence going forward and it remains to be seen what that will look mm -hmm. like. I kind of doubt it will look like Elon Musk because he is the quite the sui generis individual. But Yeah, I think his personality is not something that will be really copied or repeated, yeah. but that he's, you know, we're seeing in this election cycle just more and more tech leaders and venture capitalists being in favor of Trump, pushing for that like less regulation, things that would benefit them. Whereas you know, we traditionally thought of Silicon Valley as more left leaning. And obviously, a lot of the people that work, you know, beneath these leaders are liberal. So there's definitely a disconnect there. But more and more, some of these leaders are feeling, you know, emboldened to be in support, just not to the extent that Musk is. The pressures we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, that Silicon Valley executives might face when deciding whether or not to be an outright partisan, they weigh far more heavily on uh, media executives. And Musk has, 
you know, said he's representative of right a new new wave of media. Um, right, right. You know, X to the extent that X is a publishing platform, which he explicitly wants it to be. You know, they if you pay Elon Musk a certain amount of money every month, you can post the New Testament on X in a single <laughs> post or something. Now we've got, gone kind of far afield from Musk, but right. it, it is interesting that he sees himself as revolutionizing media as well. Do you think there are any other platforms that come close to challenging X, you know, in that mission? There's definitely, I think the platforms that have arisen, you know, to try to fix the problems of, you know, when it was Twitter. The biggest one probably is Meta's Threads, a very similar platform that like totally just boomed when it first opened because it was so easy to sign up. You know, if you had an Instagram account, you had a Threads account if you wanted, like immediately. But the activity there, even though there are a lot of users and it's a space that is more advertiser friendly because of moderation, it's not the same draw, you know, even if they have a lot of users. A lot of the other platforms that tried, you know, they were more niche, but they really made themselves focused on civil dialogue. Like that was their selling point. They were like, we're going to focus on trust and safety. Several of those really didn't make it and had to shut down. There are some that are, you know, still slowly building, but they, one is Spill, which is like a Twitter-like platform that caters more towards Black and LGBTQ plus communities. It really is about elevating those. So we see that one is like having some success and having some growth, but they're at like, I believe the last was half a million downloads. You know, that's, compared to like Twitter's peak, it's a much smaller place. I know there, there are probably lots of features of X that I just have not really looked into using because mm-hmm. uh, I'm actively trying to reduce the amount of time I spend on there. From outside, you know, intelligence firms, users are dropping. Yeah. You know, the recent estimates that I saw were like 150 million active users. Um, and it was down even from like a month before. You know, he's not adding enough to make it an appealing place to people that aren't already on there. It feels like those of us who are on there because we've been on there and we'll, you know, keep posting until or if it ever shuts down. What do you guys think is going to happen to Musk? You know, he said that if Harris wins, he thinks he'll be jailed. Um, You know, if Trump wins, he obviously has this new position providing that Trump falls through with that. I mean, I think he said as well that even if Trump wins, that there's it's going to be like financial hardship for the U.S. for a bit. I think that's the thing he said a couple of days ago. So it's like I don't feel that this is, you know, whichever way the election goes, it seems that even Musk thinks um, that there's going to be a lot of change, a very hard time, you know, not just for him, but for, for the country, the country. So how he plays into that and what he continues to do after. I think it's going to be interesting. I think he'll always be posting, elevating these views, you know, in this right wing conversation on X, but it will be interesting to see how he really pushes back. If that changes his rhetoric, if Harris wins, if he takes on a role in the Trump administration, I don't see how he could possibly have time given that he has to post on X a hundred times a day and run multiple companies, but it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. He's one of the most economically dynamic uh, and significant Americans on the world stage. He's not going anywhere. The way he would orient himself toward a Harris administration is an interesting question to me. You know, after he wakes up on November 7th or 6th or 8th or whenever we find out when the results of the election are, he will realize that he has to do business with this administration. So I think He'd probably find himself in that scenario, uh, in a situation where he is having to do the thing that business people do every day, even ones who don't jump up and down on stage about how excited they're about Donald Trump, which is figure out how to balance the regular trade-offs that come with working with government. Now, on the Trump side, if he does enter government, as he's promised to, the thing about Trump is that he doesn't really like sharing the spotlight. Yeah, you can uh, see that on the stage. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't um, 
like the perception that he's not in charge than it was than it would be with Musk should he find himself at loggerheads with Trump, which I think is far more likely than it seems right now, uh, given the major bromance between the two of them. So in certain ways, I almost think it would, his life would be more difficult under a second Trump administration than a Harris administration, given uh, those two hypotheticals that were just playing out.